Hello, and welcome to Greg Does Physics. My name is Greg, and today we are going to be doing some, you guessed it, physics. We are going to be doing problem 2.43 in Griffith's e &M. And this problem asks us to find the capacitance per unit length of two coaxial metal cylindrical tubes of radii A and B. So that looks like this. Imagine we have a cylinder of radius A, a cylinder uh, outside of it, and they are of radius B. They're coaxial, and they're both made of metal. Um, so they're conductors. And what we want to do is find the capacitance of this setup. And what is capacitance? Well, we can think that if we have two conductors like this, and we're to put a charge of plus some, some charge plus Q on one of them, and then minus Q on the other, then they'll have some uh, potential difference between the two surfaces, and the potential difference should be proportional to whatever charge we put on them. And that constant proportionality between the charge that we put on them and the potential difference is known as the capacitance. And so our job is going to be to calculate that. Now, how do we get potential? Well, our potential we get from the formula uh, this formula, the negative integral from some reference point to um, uh, so some other, you know, whatever point that you're looking at. Um, for the dot product of E and DL. But when we're looking at it, we want to look at the potential difference, i.e. the difference between the potential on the positive and the negative um, conductors. And so with all this in mind, uh, how do we go about solving this? Well, obviously we need the electric field. A big theme of Griffith's uh, chapter 2 in this textbook is figuring out what tools are at your disposal to calculate um, a given quantity of interest. And so, for example, you can add the charge distribution, and then from that charge distribution, um, figure out the electric field or the potential. Or likewise, you could have the potential and use that to calculate the electric field or the charge distribution in there. All these ways that these intrinsic quantities work between each other and the whole idea is looking at the symmetry of the problem um, how it's set up and what information you have and then from there just finding the easiest way to try and solve the problem out and so um, with this in mind looking at the uh, symmetry of this problem the easiest way to calculate the electric fields would not be to use Coulomb's law um, it would probably be to use Gauss's law, um, just because there's cylindrical sy symmetry in this charge distribution. And, uh, and specifically, we would expect thus a symmetry in the electric field. Um, for the inner electric field, we would expect the, the electric field caused by this plus Q on this inner conductor to just be radially out from the conductor everywhere. And as a result, our, our uh, equation for Gauss's law is this, the closed loop integral, um, for the dot product of um, E, the electric field, and DA for a given Gaussian surface, is what we call it, that we choose is equal to 1 over epsilon naught times the charge enclosed within that Gaussian surface. So let's say we chose a Gaussian surface to be a cylinder inside of this inner cylinder, or this anal the uh, radius A metal tube. If our Gaussian surface were entirely within here, it would not contain any charge, since the plus Q is all on the, uh, the boundary, the, the shell of this tube. And so we can expect the electric field within here to be zero, because this quantity would be zero. Likewise, if we were to choose a Gaussian surface completely outside of both of these, say a, a cylinder that has a radius greater than, uh, than B, 
centered on this uh, coaxial, centered coaxially on this system, again, our Q enclosed would be, well, the net uh, Q enclosed from the inner cylinder would be plus Q, the Q from the outer cylinder would be minus Q, plus Q minus Q, again, that would be zero. And so we would have no, no charge enclosed. And so our field outside of these two would also be zero. So the field is going to be entirely in between them, where the Q enclosed is just going to be Q. So let's choose our Gaussian surface. Like I said, I'm going to do a cylinder. Um, we can imagine it's, say, length L. Um, and let's go ahead and do this. So again, our electric field, we expect it to be pointing radially outward based on the symmetry of the charge distribution and the symmetry of, well, just the symmetry of the, of the charge distribution. And so we can take it out and we can say the magnitude of uh, this um, or dA in this case, well, dA for a cylinder would be Um, it would be whatever radius s this is. So if we say our tube is a has a radius of of s, it would be s um, d phi d z s hat. And since our electric field is going to point in the s hat direction everywhere, then taking the magnitude out, dotting the two together, it will look like this. Um, uh, now our, our phi will be integrated from zero to two pi since we're going all the way around the cylinder. The z is just gonna be the length L, so we could say we're integrating from like zero to L for z. Um, because remember our, our z isn't literally like it has to be this direction the z is looking in the direction uh, of the cylinder it goes with the cylinder and so that is what we'll get for that and so then our q enclosed we can just say over this amount it's going to be q so let's just say that we're putting this plus Q just for, that's what the, that's what the total charge is going to be just for this length L. Um, absolutely not. And so then our electric field is um, Q over 2 pi epsilon naught uh, S hat over SL. And so now what we want to do is we want to take the potential difference between the two cylinders. And so potential difference is negative integral. And we'll integrate from inner radius A to outer radius B. So A to B. Um, because this will give us the potential difference. Um, and so looking, so finding the potential difference, what we can do is we can just Look at this formulation for V, and the potential difference would be, um, well, think about it like this. If we put our reference point as uh, the radius A, and then calculate it out to the radius B, that would give us the potential at B relative to the potential at A. But that's just the potential difference that we're looking for. And so that's why we can put our limits of integration like this. Um, now, dL in spherical coordinate or uh, cylindrical coordinates is going to look like um, d s s hat plus s d phi phi hat plus d z z hat, and so dotting that with the electric field, uh, will both uh, since the electric field is only in the s hat direction, then what this will turn out to be is q over two pi epsilon naught um, d s over s, I'll put the one over l over 
here. So then this becomes uh, Q over two pi epsilon naught L. Um, and then the integral of one over S, that's just gonna be a natural log. So uh, natural log, and then it would be natural log of B minus natural log of A. But if you know your logarithm rules, then natural log of B minus natural log of A would be the same as natural log of B over A. Um, but since we could distribute this negative, we could flip the order and we'd get um, A over B natural log of A minus natural log of uh, B. Um, but then, since A is smaller than B, then this tells us that the, uh, this would give us a negative potential difference. And this tells us that the potential at at radius B is actually greater than the potential at radius A. And since we want our potential difference to be positive, uh, since capa capacitance is an intrinsically positive quantity, um, instead we would say that this would be B over A, just to make sure that it is still positive. Um, because that would be the same thing as taking the potential. Uh, it, it might be weird to see me just flip this fra uh, fraction, almost seems might seem just willy-nilly. Um, but flipping this fraction is just the same as reversing the limits of integration. Um, instead, it'd say we're taking the limit, the potential difference from the radius B into the radius A, and that's what this is. And again, this is just to make sure that what we end up with is a positive quantity. And so then finally, our C is just the um, uh, charge divided by the potential difference, and so then what we'll get is we get 2 pi epsilon naught L over ln of B over A, but the problem asked us for the capacitance per unit length, and so then we could just take out that L, and then what we say is that our capacitance per unit length is 2 pi epsilon naught over the natural log of B over A. And there we go. And uh, we could check the units. The units are uh, correct. Um, they're just the same units as epsilon naught. Um, so, yeah, you know, I, I don't think this problem is necessarily, you know, crazy, but it is good to just go over, you know, it, it's a good problem to just make sure that we still know how to choose the best way to calculate something like the potential or the electric field and then we just happen to use those quantities together to get the capacitance and it also reminds us what is the capacitance being this unit of proportionality uh, that relates the charge that is put on uh, two conductors um, with the potential difference between those two conductors in this case it's the two coaxial metal cylinders and uh, that'll be all for this episode, so thank you for watching.